Isaac Saracen is a skilled hacker, formerly employed by British Telecom Sprint. When his health failed, Isaac did the only thing he could think of. He ran. A burqa-wearing doctor known as Fatima took pity on Isaac and helped him make his way to the mysterious Star X line. At the end of all hope, they found the Star X line and the slim promise that the enigmatic beings behind the Star X could save Isaac from the implants which destroyed his life. What do you do when those who saved you have recorded everything you are? What do you do when your every action is tracked by the keylogger? ColbyJack.net is proud to present Firmware Keylogger, the third installment of Firmware by Colby Jack. Episode 53. The alley was exactly 10 minutes long. Any place in the V City was exactly 10 minutes from any spot in the alley. The alley was the exact right length at any given moment for the needs of the individual. Don't ask me how they pulled it off. Just understand that what one finds in the alley is what one desires. Actually, that is wrong. What one finds there was what one desired and coffee houses. Lots and lots of coffee houses, tea houses, and restaurants were the nature of what one found on the alley when one went searching for a job. I assumed they had paid good money in order to show up when I wasn't looking for them. Probably hadn't even paid in the local script. Most likely they had paid hard jewels for the right to show up on every block I walked down as I searched for a job. While one could walk the length of the alley in ten minutes, one could also walk along the alley for as long as one desired. It was like walking down an ever-changing commercial landscape whose businesses and residences changed as the world did when one dreamed about walking across the city. It was a concrete and glass treadmill for the hopelessly dispossessed. Or should I say depressed? It was safe to say that I was at my lowest ebb of confidence. The dark, dogged depression kept circling about whatever passed for my head, and I wondered how long I could keep it at bay without running away again. I couldn't do that. I owed Fatima a lot more than the 300 jewels she was charging me for my room and board, and I intended to pay her back. The problem was that no one who paid in Sultanis needed a computer expert, and I couldn't get a job which required jewels without having at least 50 Sultanis in order to pay a lawyer in V-City to set me up as a corporation. Thus I was stuck. See, I could get a job which paid Sultanis, which was the currency of V-City without paperwork. It was done all the time. On any given street, there were dozens of little shops and cafes where a person could buy some item, service, or refreshment from a smiling salesman or waiter. Now, when I first talked with Fatima over tea, I had assumed that the staff of the cafe we had visited were all in-game elements. In any other immersive I had played over the years, the background bits, the vendors and barkeeps and quest givers, had all been run by the server on which the game had been hosted. And while the level of detail available off the shelf for use in most games could pass the earliest Turing tests, they were in no way capable of handling the subtlety of reaction necessary to fool everyone, all of the time. Besides, no one wanted to waste the power of a full AI on a simple vendor. Frack, I had finally done it. I had referred to V-City as a game. I had promised Fatima I wouldn't refer to it as an immersive, a massively multiplayer online environment, and most assuredly, I had promised not to call it a game. But the problem was that it was a game. It had all the hallmarks of a game. It had its own fiat currency, the Sultani, which could be broken down into a hundred lira, which in turn was equal to 100 real. If that didn't sound like the monetary system for a game world, I didn't know what did. It was decimal without appearing to be decimal, and nothing like the crazy monetary systems of any historical era before decimalization. Now, until I encountered the money changers and their little stalls outside of the train stations, I had wondered how the V-City stayed operational. Once I saw their racket, I knew what the primary industry of the V-City was. It was money laundering. Well, not exactly. 
What was their business? It was taking a fraction of a jewel off of each exchange of jewels for Sultani. While one received a basic set of starting clothing and a small apartment in V-City when one first registered with the game, most people wanted more than that. Most people wanted a lot more than that. Besides, the newbie apartment they gave you was a door in a wall in a nondescript building, which was more depressing than any apartment complex I had ever seen. Even the city center housing developments were positively gardens of Eden compared to the depressing hole one received as a starting apartment. Besides, as one was required to enter and leave the game from a discreet location, and while one could log out from any restroom in the game, one had to enter the game from one fixed location. And guess where that was for the newbies? all the way at the end of a ten-minute train ride in the most depressive slum ever imagined. It was little wonder the average V-City user either started working for Sultani or bought Sultani with jewels. But there was a difference in V-City over a normal game world with a purchase economy. In V-City, it was expected that you could convert the Sultani to jewels. While the majority of games in the world used a currency, which was multiple units per jewel, V-City went the other way with an exchange rate of 10 jewels to the Sultani on the way in and 9 jewels to the Sultani on the way out. That's right. They made their cash on the margin. And it was a very hefty margin by the standards of most money changers. Normally, on free-floating currency markets, the difference between the bid and asking price was rarely more than 1% of 1% of the transaction amount meaning to make one jewel in profit off a transaction, a normal currency market would have to move 10,000 jewels. Not the V-City, though. They only needed to turn 10 jewels into one Sultani and back out as 9 jewels in order to make that same jewel. Nice work if you could get it. Now, from my level of understanding of the systems underlying V-City, I was seeing an entire system of systematic flaws which could be abused if I had the cash to start the cycle. Oh yeah, and one other thing. I'd need connections on the outside, and people who'd need to move cash without paper trail. But I couldn't do that. The only people who'd want to lose value on their money in order to spend it were criminals like Leo and David Chakava. And I'd promised Fatima I wouldn't do anything illegal. Why was it so hard to stay honest? It was as if the entire system was slanted to force one into illegal acts. I'd been moving along the alley for hours now, stopping at every shop, trying to find a job I could do with my special qualifications. At first, the alley was filled with IT firms and telemarketing operations. I had hope when I entered the first of them. An IT firm would need all kinds of remote specialists. It made sense that they would seek employees in a world of the technologically literate. Oh, how I was mistaken. What the IT firms wanted, every one of them, from Abacus Information Systems to Zephyr Systems Management, and every combination of a physical item, the word systems, and one or more of the following words, information, management, holistic, or solutions, was one thing. Help Desk Support. Every single shop I stopped in was only hiring for the help desk, and each and every one of them told me I was overqualified. Or I wouldn't be a good fit. Or I wouldn't like the environment. Or any of a thousand reasons which all sounded like crap. Here I was, a man capable of programming the relay switches which controlled the entire background of the network on which V-City depended. And I wouldn't be a good fit for a job which involved me asking a customer whether or not their device was turned on. I was desperate. I wanted to do the right thing, but these bastards weren't giving me a chance. At the first place I had stopped at, what was it? Oh, yes. Toiletta Holistic Information Systems Management Solutions. That was the name. Actually, I couldn't even remember the name. All I remember was that was the only place at which I filled out any forms or took any tests. I had given my name as Ishmael Iskasana, and had taken all their tests, 
and filled out all of their forms and had a long face-to-face -face talk with someone from human resources or workforce development or some other useless phrase which means we hire people but not people like you. To be honest, I wasn't sure if the interviewer, a uh, Jeffrey or an Ian or a Sandra, that's how much I cared. I couldn't even remember the gender of the person who could barely pass a Turing test. This person had no personality of their own, but they did have leave to pass judgment on me. This useless piece of south wall trash had the nerve to tell me someone who could pass an honest-to-good Turing test and who had an actual personality of their own, thank you very much, that they weren't a good fit. And then there were words to the effect of, thank you very much, and don't let the door hit you on the way out, and please don't come back, ever. I thought about the series of words and phrases I had used while I was all but begging for employment and couldn't find anything offensive or defensive either. I had been as perfect a candidate as I could have been. I would have hired me. There had to be something wrong with that interviewer gal. She just couldn't see quality when it sat before her. She wasn't the only shop on the street. I tried a second IT firm. It was a useless named company with useless employees who greeted me with a, Welcome, Mr. Isaac Kasona. I am sorry, we aren't hiring today. I was escorted back onto the street with a, We have all your information, and we will be in touch when we need someone of your talents. Don't call us. We'll call you. That was so strange. I hadn't even told them my name. I hadn't even said a word. It was as if they knew what I wanted before I entered, and they were having none of it. Back on the street, I noticed the alley had changed while I was inside. It had become darker, dingier, more lived in. The ever-present cafes were gone. In their place were shops, which would have been strip joints out in the real world. Along their walls were images of naked men performing all manners of acts in a medium which appeared to be one part neon and one part oil paint. And there wasn't just one of these places. There were hundreds. They had names like Beanpole, Beef Thermometer, Rodzilla, and Skin Bus. I felt like I was back at St. O'Hay's in a penis naming contest. It was as if I had just walked into an alternate universe where all of the strip clubs featured male performers. I walked down the alley slowly, looking at the lewd depictions of men performing moves I had only ever witnessed women performing before. Then I saw a sign advertising full frontal lap dances and became confused. Did the woman sit on the dancer's lap or the other way around? I was trying to understand exactly what I was seeing when the first daemon arrived. There was no fire in brimstone. It wasn't that type of daemon. What alerted me to its presence was that it wore a version of my face I hadn't seen since college. It was that, and the fact that it addressed me by my number. Ishmael! One zero! I am so glad to have found you! The daemon, with a face from a decade before, said as it took my hand in a hearty shake. While the face was familiar, as it was my own, I had no idea who I was talking to. I'm sorry, I said as I stared into a face I hadn't seen outside a mirror before. You appear to have me at a disadvantage. It's me, the faux me said. Don't you remember me? I was zero zero. I'm a Samuel now. Samuel Noir, to be exact. I snorted. Samuel Noir. I'd stick with Sam Noir. Sounds a bit less melodramatic. Great, the exact kind of people I had been attempting to avoid. First, I couldn't find a job. And then one of the reasons I was stuck in this situation showed up on my doorstep while I was looking at men performing all manners of suggestive acts on the sides of buildings. I caught him looking at the images with a quizzical look on his face. I shook my head. I, well, yeah, I don't know why I'm here. Sam nodded knowingly. The world is rarely what it seems. He examined his feet, scuffed a shoe, and gave me a smile. Though, if you were switching your alignment, who'd I be to question? And before you ask, no, I am not into doing a little experimentation. 
I threw my arms over my head and cried, Why'd you have to go there? Sam smiled and said, I didn't go anywhere. It was you who was standing on a street full of strip joints advertising male companionship. Not me, son. Well, I said as I looked at what appeared to be an infinite number of jiggle bars. I have no idea how I got here. Sam Noir appeared to enjoy living up to his silly name. He started questioning me like a character out of a cheap detective novel. Interesting. What were you doing right before you found yourself standing before a sign which appears to be advertising oral pleasures for the discerning businesswoman? I suddenly realized what the chap in the picture was doing, though there was no lady present in the animation. I turned away like a blushing virgin. Then I started to wonder about something Sam said, and turned back to examine the image. What's that businesswoman in this advert? It looked like a writhing man on his knees licking ice cream from between his fingers, which were spread into a V. Where did, on this advert does it say discerning businesswoman? Sam smiled and said, Well, he is wearing a pillbox hat, and those are all the rage among the more money than we know what to do with it class and his shoes. I looked at the shoes. They appeared to be some kind of platform shoes, popular among women who wanted the heights of heels without the instability and ankle ache. I had seen them many times on the feet of the denizens of the 111th floor at BTS, who wanted yet another way to tower over the proles in the trenches. Not that many of them actually needed the extra inches of height. Most of the women who wore those shoes were taller than me in stocking feet. But time and tradition are strange things and things change even more slowly at the top. Firmware Keylogger begins where firmware proxy ends, which in turn followed on the heels of firmware hijacked. Firmware hijacked proxy and keylogger are all available in ebook versions from our store at shop.colbyjack.net, amazon.com, barnesandnoble.com, and smashwords.com. Just search for Colby Tracks. That's C O L B Y T R A X. I'm the only one. A complete audiobook version of both firmware, hijacked, proxy, and soon keylogger is available for download through our shop as well. If you don't need any stuff but would like to support our work, drop on by colbyjack.net and hit the pretty little donate button conveniently located on the right hand side of the blog roll. Firmware Keylogger is released under a Creative Commons, non-commercial, attribution, share-alike license. Do what you want with it. Just don't sell it and always tell people where it came from. If you receive this from a friend and want more information about ColbyJack.net and our split personality website, just drop on over to ColbyJack.net and select either the audio or visual side. The audio side carries our podcast while the visual side carries our writings. Whichever side catches your fancy is fine with us. We're of two minds about the whole thing anyway. I do mostly Twitter, so if you do the tweets and want to follow me, I'm Colby Tracks. That's C-O-L-B-Y-T-R-A-X. Thank you once again. Remember to be fabulous and have a wonderful week. <laughs>